This story starts on the 26th of May, 1908, in a place called Majid i Suleiman, in the southwest of a country that was then called Persia. It was a crucial moment for a small group of explorers who'd been looking for oil all over the territory for six years. Their financial backers in London, the Burma Oil Company, were about to order them to give up on the project. The man in charge of drilling was called George Bernard Reynolds. He was a self-taught geologist and a graduate of the Royal Indian Engineering College. Reynolds was in his 50s. He was the son of a vice admiral and, by all accounts, a tough, uncompromising character. He was sure there was oil in Persia, even if the Burma Oil Company may have wanted him to stop. The question, when do you expect to strike oil, is on the lips of all those interested in the success of the undertaking. But it's one I find exceedingly difficult to answer. I'd just like to read you the last bit here of his story, because uh, I think this shows the, the, the nature of, of the objective approach he had to this. This, this man was, was not only an engineer, he was a scientist. And he gets to the point of, of why he's in Majdi Suleiman. And he's already there because he's got these great oil seeps, which are actually still there today. So he says, a crack is formed and the oil stored below is found to issue at this spot. The conditions at Maidan Banaftun, Majid Suleiman, are particularly a case in point, as there, owing to the intersection of two folds, the underlying limestone must be cracked considerably, and the large exudations of oil is the result. This is the man whose dream had inspired the whole Persian expedition, William Knox Darcy friend of the English royal family who'd made a fortune out of gold mining in Australia. William Knox Darcy took an enormous risk. He got into the oil business because he was a, a multimillionaire and he said to himself, what's the next best thing? And he decided that oil was a nice little venture he'd like to get into. And he started it off as a hobby, rather like a wealthy man today has a racehorse. The trouble was he was pouring money down a big black hole. Reynolds, Darcy's man in southwest Persia, knew he was roughly in the right place. But even a reservoir as big as Majid i Suleiman turned out to be can be easy to miss. This is the cross section I drew when I was there. And it wasn't obvious to me at the time that <laughs> had I been Reynolds, I would have gone to the same place which, of course, is deeply embarrassing. This was the early days of oil exploration. Reynolds' team were drilling with the percussion method, banging the steel against the rock. Only 10 days before the 26th of May, they lost the bit and had to fish for it. It has changed, but not in as much as that the old timers would not recognize. We're still using a draw works. We're using all the hoisting arrangement is identical they would recognize these elevators, they would recognize the slips. Everything has got a lot bigger. In 1908, they were probably drilling with three-inch drill pipe, not much bigger, uh, four-inch drill pipe possibly. But uh, they were drilling to much shallower depths, so all the equipment would be smaller, but they would immediately recognize it. Darcy sent off his men to negotiate a contract or a concession with the Shah of Persia at the time. The concession was, uh, that they negotiated was 480,000 square miles. Now, Britain is about 90,000 square miles in area. So this was five times the area of Britain. So this was a really bold move by Darcy, and, uh, and as time prove, has proven it to be, a, a really insightful one as well. But by May 1908, his money was almost exhausted. He'd even put his magnificent mansion just outside London up for sale.
Shut it down. Shut it down, now, please. Shut it down. News of the discovery reached the Burma Oil Company in Glasgow. They had acquired their stake in the enterprise when Darcy was strapped for cash. Now, they bought him out and formed a company called Anglo-Persian to exploit the find. But how to get the oil out, how to refine it and bring it to market? It was a Burma technician, the general manager of the refinery at Rangoon, who suggested Abadan on the Shat al-Arab, 138 miles southwest of Majid de Suleiman. There were no roads. Have you seen the photos? There's a sort of photo of a mud flat with some palm trees on it that became Abadan. There's no labor force in the sense that of an industrial labor force, you know, for refineries and so on. It's an area that's completely out of the normal range of this kind of activity, completely. One thousand local labourers and 37 Europeans ran the pipeline down to Abadan. You steam up the Shatel Arab in a ship and palm trees on each bank. Right behind the palm trees there's desert and everything is quiet and the great wide river is sort of coffee-coloured. and It's peaceful and hot, stinking hot. By the time the refinery was up and running, Anglo-Persian had a new boss, Charles Greenway, Champagne Charlie as he was later known who'd been manager of an oil trading house in Bombay. Not, by all accounts, an easy man. One of the first things he did was to hire a firm of managing agents who, according to Reynolds, last saw natives on the Zambezi, and then fired the man who discovered the field. Reynolds was given a thousand pounds in compensation. But then Greenway wasn't an explorer. He was a businessman and the firm wasn't yet making any money. BP's a Johnny come lately, formed in 1908. By the time BP's formed, Royal Dutch Shell and Rockefeller's group were huge. Rockefeller's Standard Oil, broken up into numerous companies by antitrust legislation, were world leaders in the industry. They and Shell had not yet got into the Middle East. Anglo-Persian's massive find in majid e Suleiman was a cheap and apparently unstoppable source of crude oil. Shell had tankers to distribute their oil. Anglo-Persian didn't. Greenway made an alliance with Shell to shift Anglo-Persian's crude, but it wasn't enough to make the company financially stable. The company was basically running out of money very quickly and appealed to the, you know, the sort of British, well, Churchill in particular. Um, so that relationship was really crucial in that period. And Greenway particularly seems to have been very adept at presenting Shell as a rather dodgy company, which of course it was not, and as presenting BP, of course, as a, you know, um, a stalwartly British 
company. In 1911, Winston Churchill was the first Lord of the Admiralty. He had his eye on the British Navy and how it was fueled. Churchill put up 2.2 million pounds to save Anglo-Persian. The government acquired a majority shareholding and put two directors on the board. Across the seas, rival navies watch each other warily. To date, all ships are coal burning, and majority will be for some years to come. But Winston Churchill, now First Lord of the Admiralty, is active in negotiations with new oil concerns in the Middle East, in which the government hold the lion's share. Under his direction, the British battle fleet begins to turn over to oil firing. A far-sighted move ensures that the Navy is not lacking in what is needful. The Persian oil fields went on producing throughout the First War. In 1914, 73,000 tonnes to the Navy. By 1918, 424,000 tonnes. When Turkey entered the war on Germany's side in 1914, the British Army was sent to defend the Abadan refinery. They went on to capture Basra and later Baghdad. Oil literally fuels armed conflict, and the victors profit from it. Lord Greenway, the first chairman of the company, he, he, his view in 1914 was that a company that the size he wanted this one to be, the Anglo-Persian Oil Company, should be vertically integrated. In other words, it should do everything. Uh, search for its oil, produce its oil, ship its oil, refine its oil, market its oil, and transsell whatever it marketed and move it to the, to the markets. The shipping arm of Greenway's integrated oil company was called British Petroleum. Ironically, a German company which had fallen into English hands as part of the spoils of war. In 604 years of recorded shipbuilding at Sunderland on the River Weir, no larger ship has been launched than this 16,000 ton motor tanker. She's another addition to the fleet which carries the products of the Persian oil fields across the world. I name this ship British Reliance. May God bless her and all who sail in her. The First War was not simply a European conflict, and victory over Germany and the Ottoman Empire in 1918 had huge implications for oil exploration in the Middle East. The desert town of Kirkuk, about 150 miles north of Baghdad, is the center of the great oil fields of Iraq and is today the scene of a unique ceremony as an Iraq Air Force machine brings the young King Ghazi of Iraq to inaugurate the famous pipeline. He meets Sir John Cadman, the man behind the gigantic engineering feat, with directors of the Iraq Petroleum Company. While After the war, the French, British and Americans carved up the oil concessions in the region. The lucky chairman who inherited all this was John Cadman, who ran the company from 1927. Cadman, the first proper scientist to have control of the company, had started out life as a coal mine manager and later a professor of mining at Birmingham University. He'd begun magnetic field surveys for the Geological Society and he initiated the huge task of drawing the oil map of the company's concession in what was still called Persia. When we were out in the field, <coughs> We got up at five in the morning. We went with a, a plane cable and a map. We, we had to make a map up, other, otherwise we, we couldn't have put it onto the paper at, at all. They were mighty men. I mean, they had the capacity to, to look at rocks in outcrop and map and build pictures of what the subsurface looked like in, in fantastic detail. And their ability to define stratigraphy was phenomenal in the field. Oh. Some of the maps were just pieces of art, pieces of art. On these reconnaissance surveys that we went on, they were about um, six months. 
after all, this is big country, you know, big scale country. Some of the early survey work there was staggering, staggeringly good. It was particularly precipitated by the change in the concession laws. The original Anglo-Persian concession covered the whole of the country. Assisted by such maps, the geologists set out to study the outcrops of strata and to compile a detailed geological map. I think I'm not boasting in saying that the BP exploration knowledge and ability and techniques were the envy of all the oil companies in the world. Cadman may have inherited the wealth of British imperial interests in the Middle East, but the political climate there was changing. The people making the deal for Persia were themselves a sort of small group in that country that happened to, you know, in a sense, you could argue that they were kind of looking after their own interests rather than the interests of their country necessarily in a broader based sense. So the original deal was that Iran got 16% or Persia got 16% of the profits. But it clearly was negotiated before people could really see through to where this would end up. So it ended up with obviously a lot of problems about how do you interpret this agreement, which was drawn up at a time when no one could have foreseen actually just how big a scale thing this whole this whole deal would become. Out of the chaos of the World War came a new leader, Reza Khan, colonel of an Iranian Cossack regiment. In 1921, Reza Khan, with a handful of men, marched into Tehran and assumed direction of affairs. He started to rebuild this barren, disorganized country. Reza Shah was a great modernizer and a total autocrat. Unlike, say, the Qajar rulers that were there when BP negotiated the original deal. I mean, he was kind of a military strongman, really. Can Iran, a need as she is of revenue, and knowing for certain that an important source such as the oil mines and the oil concession can yield her several times more revenue than what she is at present receives from the company, tolerate such a situation? The Shah of Persia wanted a reduction of the concession area to 100,000 square miles, a settlement on past royalties, and a guaranteed annual payment of three quarters of a million pounds. Cadman flew to Tehran via Kuwait City to renegotiate the concession for the company. I think Cadman seems to me to have been very tough. I think they were very tough, by the way. His Imperial Majesty Riza Shah Pahlavi takes the salute at the celebration of his march on Tehran 16 years ago. The Shah gave a little homily to his ministers, who he said, were down on the ground and could not see very far beyond their noses, whereas he was placed on a pinnacle and could see the great world around him. The ministers sat in silence, listening to this lecture like small schoolboys. Here is Cadman at Tehran Airfield just after the negotiations were over. I felt we had been pretty well plucked. These arguments about who owns the oil started actually quite, quite early on, really. BP wasn't the first to suffer this. The Shah changed the name of the country in 1935, perhaps to emphasize his modernity. The company also promised to employ Iranian labor and recruit and train skilled employees. Anglo-Iranian and other majors like Shell were beginning to realize they needed to cooperate to survive. There was a market for petrol. The number of motorists rose by a million from the 20s to the 30s. Anglo-Iranian, who came to the marketplace later than Shell and simply didn't have enough garages, shared their marketing operations with Shell. The real imperative was to find somewhere to sell the stuff still gushing out of the gigantic field in southwest Persia. To cope with these new markets, the Abadan refinery was getting bigger and bigger, right up until the beginning of the Second World War. Even then, the work on it and in it did not stop. The refinery itself, when I got there in 41, was pretty much two-thirds developed. There was anything it wanted. The Rugger Club got a rugby pitch, ploughed out of the desert, and uh, the cricket club got a cricket oval 
and the golf club's got 18 holes laid out with rodeo greens. One of the refinery's great achievements, helped by chemists like Colin Williamson, was to make aviation spirit from the sulphur-heavy Maji de Suleiman crude, not unlike distilling whiskey on a huge scale. This revolutionary new process was developed at Sunbury, Anglo-Iranian Centre for Scientific Research and Development. The processes needed for aviation spirit production were alkylation isomerization, which was invented at Sunray, superfractionation, which were colossal fractionating towers. The net result was when we started, the aviation production was virtually nil. By the time all the plants were commissioned, 1945 or something like that, we were running at a million tonnes a year. The British government needed aviation spirit very badly indeed. By the time Williamson and Sawyer reached Abadan, the world was once more at war. There's no doubt about it. The Germans were uh, gambling on picking it up like a ripe plum. Two divisions of the British Army in India were sent to protect Abadan and the oil fields. The Shah was moving a little too close to the Nazis for comfort. The division secured Anglo-Iranian's facilities and moved on to Tehran. The Shah abdicated in favor of his 22-year-old son. And now our camera records for you the beginning of a new rule. The prime minister and the military governor arrive at the parliament house, preceding the young Shah to be, who succeeds on the abdication of his father. We were all summoned to the club one day. It would be 42. The Germans were in, coming into the Caucasus and were trying to make a bridgehead on the Caspian. If they'd done that, they would have been able to mount an attack through Iran. Every pump, for instance, was going to be sabotaged in exactly the same way so that the Germans couldn't cannibalize the wreckage and make a good pump out of the bits of several. And we were all looking forward, no end, to the Big Bang. <laughs> to an enemy thirsting for oil, the fabulous towers of Abadan glittered truly like those of an Eastern fable. Towards them, he reached out avidly. But like any Eastern mirage, they were to remain forever unobtainable. Wars remold industrial workers in the heroic image. While the Germans and their allies, the Turks, were failing to get their hands on Abadan, back in England, in the unlikely venue of Ekring, Nottinghamshire, workers like Kevin Topham and Doug Wallace were finding oil for the company as part of the war effort. It was the only oil field in the oil UK. Field, yeah. mm. when, when was oil discovered here? 1939. A April. April. Now. That was just previous to the Second World War. Britain is producing oil. Dotted about the countryside is evidence of this new industry. These nodding donkeys are the only outward signs of an important wartime achievement. In 1940, plans for home oil production were speeded up as a war emergency. I don't suppose you ever thought you'd leave the oil fields of America to come and drill for oil in England, eh? You're darn right I did. Fact is, until I came over here, I had no idea oil ever existed in this country. The early borings were disappointing, but the oil men persevered, and at last, in June 1939, promising results were obtained from an area near Newark. Oil in commercial quantities could be produced at Ekring. Over four million barrels. Actually, yes. find crude oil, and 80% and of that was used on uh, Pluto, which was pipeline under the ocean, in preparation for D-Day. It was excellent fuel oil for the Spitfires, Hurricanes, etc. Meanwhile, Anglo-Iranian tanker crews were doing a very dangerous job. 
especially if it's an oil tanker carrying aviation spirit or having just discharged aviation spirit and being full of gas there. Mm -hmm. My great friend and colleague, Frank Broad, his father was a master in the company, and he took a new ship away in 1943, I think, and on the way uh, home, I think, from the West Indies, she was torpedoed and burst into flames. All the crew perished in the burning after end of the ship. In spite of such horrors, Anglo-Iranian did manage to produce more oil. From 135,000 barrels a day in 1941 to 345,000 in 1945. But when the victory was won, the company and its new chairman, William Fraser, discovered that as far as it was concerned, war was just beginning. Mohammad Mossadegh, leader of the new Iranian National Party. When he became prime minister in April 1951, he pushed through a law to nationalize Iran's oil industry. It would be sad indeed if this fruitful partnership should cease after so many years. Mossadegh wanted none of it. As the Iranian authorities moved to take over oil plants and docks, and the British technicians unanimously refused to accept employment with the new regime, the situation seemed hopeless. There was a Persian proclamation which begins, now that by the grace of God, the oil has been nationalized, and of course, Increasingly, we became liable to be saboteurs. We were still under BP management. We were never under National Iran and Oil Company management. And BP management said, when we say so, we will take you out of the country. And they were never stopped doing that. I got a letter from the local governor general of the Awas province to say I was to be brought for a military tribunal on a charge of sabotage, uh, and in brackets, the penalty is death. The letter also mentioned that I was guilty, which seemed rather premature, as I hadn't been brought to, before the tribunal. Um, and the ambassador sent me a signal saying that I must leave at once or there would be a war. 95% of the oil is exported and sold abroad. I do not know of any country which has attempted to nationalize an export business of 95% of the product. The Persians think that by nationalizing oil they are going to get rich. Unfortunately, the reverse will be the case. Yes, that is Persia's problem. The oil fields produce more than 30 million tons a year, practically all of which must be sold abroad to bring in revenue to keep the organization running. The Iranians who were taking over from Tehran and knew nothing whatever about the oil industry, honestly believed that when a skipper came alongside and took a cargo of oil on board, a bag of gold changed hands for the cargo. They honestly believed that payment was made in money for every cargo as it was shipped. Uh, we got the foreign staff out, and the day came, and uh, we were escorted out, um, sent out, got on to the Mauritius, with many of my Iranian graduates in tears, and never thought it would happen. With all attempts at a compromise failing, the British cruiser Mauritius brings sanity to the worsening situation as it stands offshore, ready to protect the lives of British employees and their families. On the Mauritius, they had the Royal Marines. And when the time approached for us to go, the Mauritius started and the band played Colonel Bogey. And I just think every expatriate aboard sang the words of Colonel Bogey, the unexpurgated words. to the canal 
zone where the generals were all based. And I stayed with one of them on the, in the canal zone on a barge. And the three of them, the Navy, Army and Air Force, and I all had a dinner or cat together. And they said, we can do nothing. We have uh, assembled a large military force, naval, Air Force, but the government refused to allow us to do anything. London, my directors of the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company met to discuss the latest news from the Persian oil fields. The man bringing home the news was Mr. Drake, the company's general manager in Abadan. Later, Mr. Drake, at Mr. Attlee's invitation, went to number 10 to place before the cabinet a first-hand account of the present Persian drama. In BP, the chief protagonist is um, William Fraser, or Lord Stratalmond, as he became, who was the chairman and chief executive. And he has since then, in most of the sort of most of the people who've you know worked at this and studied the records and in the, in the academic community anyway he has been basically very heavily criticized for being very inflexible for lacking the vision to understand the international diplomatic aspects and consequences of the dispute in other words for seeing it in a narrow commercial sense willie fraser bunkered down in the boardroom while the Americans and the British government set about trying to do a deal with the Iranians. Or, as Fraser and later Churchill saw it, preparing to spend company money on making their lives easier. Ladies and gentlemen, we have had one heavy loss, which I think might have been avoided by courage and firmness. We have been robbed by violence of the Persian oil industry, which we created, and from which Persia had derived such great benefit and could derive even greater benefit. There was this image that was cultivated of Mossadegh in the West, that he was a bit of a kind of nutter. And he, you know, he met people in his pyjamas. Well, Churchill used to meet people in bed too, you know. I mean, I hesitate to use the word obsessed. I mean, he seems to have been a person who was genuine. I mean, he was a showman and he knew how to, you know, he went to the States and he pulled off, he was very successful in appealing to American um, policy makers. Je suis très heureux. I am very glad to come to the United States to defend on the Security Council my country, and I am very glad of the result. For nearly two years, the company was out of Iran. Fraser wouldn't budge. Then Mossadegh made the mistake of leaning towards Moscow. The British and the Americans tried to organize a coup against him. But after the Shah had ordered his dismissal, Mossadegh fought back. The Shah fled to Rome with no clothes and no money. It wasn't until the army organized a counter coup that Mossadegh was toppled. Was the company involved? A lot of people have come to me over the years and kind of said, you know, surely BP, you know, was in some way involved. Weren't they a party to this? Didn't they have discussions about it? Or were they actually the instigators of it? Like I said to you before, I've never found I've never found anything to suggest that that's the case. Um, my own reading of the situation also, if you look at the sort of circumstantial evidence, if you like, I mean, BP had been out of Iran since October 51, so they hadn't had people sort of on the ground there. Uh, Fraser was persona non grata, really, with, with the British government because of, the sta because of his hardline stance. Meanwhile, the mob flocked the streets, demanding the return of the Shah. Anglo-Iranian may not have been involved in the counter-coup against Mossadegh, but once again, the politics of the situation had played out in the company's favor. The thoughts of Britain instinctively turned to Abaddon, that monument to British enterprise and engineering skill. Forced to abandon what we had created in the wilderness, is it too much to hope that we shall see once more the tankers of Britain at Abaddon? Maybe sanity will yet prevail, and Iran and Britain go forward in harmony. Wildly optimistic. In fact, a deal was worked out with the young Shah through an international consortium set up by the British and American governments. 
Fraser drove a hard bargain, ending up with 40% of the international consortium's royalties. In 1954, the company renamed itself British Petroleum. The originally German outfit Greenway had been granted by the British government at the beginning of the First War. But they lost the biggest refinery in the world. How were they going to cope? I would say 80% of the work in London office for anglo Iranian was for Aberdeen. I mean, Aberdeen was the big thing. I mean, they had refineries already in Grangemouth and Landarcy, but nowhere else much. Throughout the history of the oil industry previously, the trend had been that you built your big refineries near your sources of production. So you didn't move your crude very far, you moved your products further. Uh, you refined near the oil field. Mm -hmm. But by the post-war years, that was changing, and people were transporting the crude oil in bigger tankers, which was cheaper, and they were refining in markets and then doing shorter runs with products. And all that BP did was accelerate the trend. They built a number of refineries in Europe and in Australia. <laughs> The Isle of Grain is a peninsula on the coast of Kent. It is a remote, rather eerie district. They built a new refinery, the Isle of Grain. They improved and added to the existing refineries, Grangemouth in Scotland and Clandassie in South Wales, both built in the 1920s. But where were they going to find their source of strength? For years, the company had lived off the colossal reserves in Iran. Where now? The explorers, who were BP's traditional great strength areas, were always a slight kind of, I won't say a law unto themselves, because that implies a sort of, you know, they weren't kind of renegade in any way, but they had a different culture to the sort of hierarchical office-based culture. They tended to kind of be out in the field for long periods doing surveys and so on. They heard that one in Australia. The search for oil continued. In the 1950s, explorers looked to new territories all over the world, from Nigeria to Trinidad. Money spent on finding oil increased by more than 12 million pounds. This pioneering spirit led to two very important discoveries of two gigantic oil fields. The Prudhoe Bay field in Alaska and the North Sea. The North Sea story begins at the end of the 50s. That explosion wasn't a depth charge or a mine, and it wasn't any part of any naval or military exercise. It's the beginning of a new kind of treasure hunt miles out here in the North Sea. One, seven, six, five, zero. The North Sea rarely became of interest with two things happening. The first was the development of offshore techniques in the United States, which happened really pretty soon after the war, gradually, and, and then uh, through the 50s. And the other event was the finding of the very large gas field, the Groningen. Groningen, a name that started the present treasure hunt. For here in Holland, three years ago, natural gas was found, a huge deposit, the second biggest in the world and the rocks that lie under the North Sea are just the same sort as lie under Northern Holland. That was in 1959. But it wasn't until 1965 that BP found the first gas field in British waters, in West Seoul, just off East Anglia. The rig that drilled it was called the Sea Gem. Sea stands on the seabed 40-odd miles off the Humber coast. And taking a longish view, this could be the largest bonus for Britain since the big-scale development of coal. That possibility depended on the gas being of high quality. And there it was, proof that this fuel from 10,000 feet below fulfills the experts' highest hopes. After the triumph, tragedy. At the scene of her discovery, the rig Sea Gem collapsed and sank in 15 fathoms with the loss of 13 lives. I'd been on board an hour when they started lowering the rig to sea level. And instead of the usual gentle descent, it went down in one huge crash. 
The radio operator was a champion swimmer. He stood on the rail, dived into the water and swam out to the lifeboat, which was about 80 yards away. He managed to get into the lifeboat, the only man that did. And uh, when they picked him out, when the chopper picked him out, he did froze to death. Another reminder that the North Sea offers no easy pickings. This was a warning that the offshore wealth would be hard won, that it would be given grudgingly, surrendered spitefully. Ten years later came the first great oil success in the North Sea, the Fortis Field. The Fortis Field, the first oil found in British waters, lying between Scotland and Norway in the middle of the North Sea. All oil exploration ventures, you never know all the variables, and you still never know normally whether there's oil there or not till you drill, because why it's there is a product of the whole history of geology, not just the shape of the thing as it is now. You need to know what happened when the oil was generated and moved, and this is something which means making inspired guesses, is what they often are, on, on when the oil got in, or if it got in, or if it escaped. And it wasn't like it had been picked out as a drillable structure, and the decision of the moment of drilling it was one where I intervened, but it would have been drilled. I merely changed the sequence. We knew that it had some similarity to things which had oil in, but we didn't know this particular Sam was going to be such a good one, and it turned out to be an absolute honey. I haven't come here to make a policy statement. I think this must be a day of uh, celebration, a day of congratulation to the firms and to the people who have brought this oil ashore from under the most uh, terrifying and capricious waters in the world. After the success at Fortis, the hunt moved further north to the East Shetland Basin. It was here that the company was led to the deepest of all the North Sea oil fields, Magnus. We were doing front end engineering exercises on it for a number of years. It was one of those it was just too difficult and it was going to be too costly. So you're talking about 1.3 billion. Magnus is the furthest north in the British sector and the deepest water, which I think was its claim to fame. We were in 605 feet of water, which is really an extension of what had been done before by 50%. Roger, we're opening now. When the time came to fill parts of a jacket with water to upend it so it would take its proper position, the wretched piles, most of them, fell out and pinned the jacket to the seabed at an angle that was not exactly planned. Um, this caused certain consternation for two to three days. Magnus, costliest single structure in British industrial history, in jeopardy. Every conceivable rescue operation was weighed and computed. As the jacket came upright, a number of piles had broken loose. The divers brought back good news. Damage was negligible, and it should be possible for tugs to pull the jacket free. OK, uh, locate at one red and execute. OK, let's bring it down, Father Hilda. What's open? In the end of the day, we got hold of every tug we could find around the North Sea that was anywhere near, tied it to the end, gave it a big pull, and thank God it came off. Finally, she's down. The steel structure in the dockyard has become an island in the North Sea. Soon, three more islands will be created here over the 40s. The object, to bring oil in quantity to Britain's shores from beneath the North Sea. The cost and the complexity of the engineering on Magnus was terrifying. Magnus. The cost, 1.3 billion pounds. Planned production, 120,000 barrels of oil a day. 
the North Sea drives a hard bargain. Meanwhile, areas of the world where oil was cheaper and easier to get at were becoming inaccessible for different reasons. Politics. I would put it down really to one man and really one incident. The one man was Gaddafi. And the Western oil companies made some phenomenal finds uh, in Libya. And Gaddafi seized power, felt, I think, with some justification that the oil price was too low. It was, in fact, very substantially the fact that Libyan oil had come onto the market that depressed the price of oil so much. That Gaddafi said, my country has existed without oil for 5,000 years. If I don't get the right price, it can exist for the next 5,000 years without it. And Gaddafi's intervention enabled OPEC to say, this five-year deal really isn't going the way we want it to go. You, the oil companies, have got to come and renegotiate, and you've got to pay considerably more. OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. Iran, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Iraq, and Venezuela had been formed as early as 1960 to protect these mainly Arab oil-producing states. So we arrived in Vienna, ready to start negotiating the next day with OPEC. And on the morning that we were due to start our negotiations, of course, the, uh, the Yom Kippur War broke out. <laughs> Egyptians did terribly well at the beginning of the war, so uh, this, of course, was fine for a, for a day in my negotiations. But after a couple of days, of course, the Israelis started to strike back, and uh, they started to get rather gloomy. From that point on, the oil companies, really, who had basically set the price previously by their negotiating posture, were never again in a position to say, you know, this is the price that oil will fetch in the market. The OPEC, and principally the Arab members of OPEC, said, well, this is the price that oil's got to be. Um, take it or don't take it. And then a year later, the nationalization proposals started coming through. Arab states started to take control of their oil. The subsequent price rises had a serious effect on the British economy. And British politicians started to lean on BP, of which, as will be remembered, they still owned 51%. My Lord Mayor, it's natural that within Britain, public attention should focus on one particular consequence of war in the Middle East, its effect on our oil supplies. I was suddenly sent for by Heath. Oh, he asked me, is it possible for BP to supply the whole of the UK requirements 100%? And I said, yes, certainly. But if we were to do so, we'd have to cut supplies to the other European countries. He said, well, never mind about that. That's what I want you to do. He went on and on. I finally said, well, the only hope I suppose I might be able to plead force majeure if you give me a bit of paper to say that's what you want me to do. He lost his temper and said, no way, you know jolly well I can't. That's all he said. Uh, no jolly well I can't do that. And uh, so we parted brass rags that meeting. <laughs> and so that was really, I think, you know, a major confrontation. And of course, you then had the miners' strike in the following year, and the Conservatives went out of office. They lost that election, basically, and combination of the three-day week. Heath was replaced at number 10 by Harold Wilson. The Labour Party had fewer ideological qualms about the nationalisation of a vital industry. And it is not entirely misplaced humour when I've told our friends abroad that a British Minister of Energy will be chairman of OPEC in the 1980s. We wanted uh, uh, to have a growing control over the assets because it was clear that the revenue from the gas and later even more the oil was going to be on a very big scale and we wanted this to be at the disposal of Britain for uh, re-equipping our industry. BNOC. British National Oil Company was formed, which had statutory rights to buy the oil as it was produced from all of the oil companies. 
And very strange, I went to pay my call on Wedgwood Penn when he was appointed Minister of Oil, or whatever they called it. And I used to go around the Rolls Royce in those days, a company Rolls Royce, but I th thought, well, I, this man Ben, and I got my chauffeur to put the Rolls Royce in the garage, get hold of the most ancient jalopy he could find for me to go and call on Mr. Ben. The only real answer nationally is that national assets should be nationally owned, the rate of, depl uh, of depletion should be controlled, the revenue should be available, and you keep the oil companies at arm's length. And in fact, I was told, and it was confirmed by McFadden, who was the Shell man, that he tried to persuade Shell to try and take over BP. But the right wing of the Labour Party were never really in favour of state ownership. We believe in trying to steer uh, revenue into restructuring industry, things like that. And as the Labour government ran out of money, they looked to business to keep them afloat. The way I look at it is this. Within a few years' time, oil will start flowing in from around our shores and a lot of our problems will be that much easier. Ironically, I suppose, when uh, Dennis Healy was summoned to the IMF, the Labour government's financial situation was such that they looked around and said, well, you know, what have we got that we can sell that somebody will pay a good price for? And so that was the first tranche of, of the BP share sale. Under the new Conservative government of Margaret Thatcher, the full-scale privatisation of the company went ahead. It's me. I know it's your hair now. There's a band next Friday. It started. Britain's latest share offer is getting underway. BP. It became more commercial, without a doubt. And I think Peter Walters had a lot to do with that. And I think also the changing structure of the industry had a lot to do with it. In 1986, the Treasury sold off its remaining 32% of shares in BP in one go. If you were to ask me, you know, what is the thing about which I feel worst in my whole period in BP, and particularly in, during my chairmanship, it was the, the disaster of the share sale. It's the start of a new phase for BP. It's an important day for the government, and more importantly than that, a great day for Britain and the shareholding population. Before the sale could begin, the world stock markets collapsed, and the price of BP shares, so dramatically unveiled, collapsed with them. And that enabled the Kuwaitis basically to defy the British government and to pick up shares cheaply. Certainly we in the company felt was very unhealthy for BP, you know, to have, have a competitor. I mean, Kuwait, the Kuwait government is the same as the Kuwait oil industry, and there they were, sitting with 22% of our shares, which if they had taken it to the full progression of such a large holding, could have given them a couple of directors on the board, they would have been privy to all our commercial secrets. Indeed, they may well, with a big shareholding, have been able to frustrate some. So we said, this is not healthy. Following pressure from the British government, Kuwait was forced to dispose of more than half its shareholding. Eventually, we were able to, uh, to do a deal with the Kuwaitis to buy them back. The cost of buying back the shares was enormous. Luckily, as well as its income from the North Sea, BP had another hugely successful field in North America. The story begins in Alaska in 1957. Between Canada and Siberia, feet in the Pacific and ahead in the Arctic lies Alaska, the largest, most mountainous and coldest of the United States. This is the thing you have to remember in all credits given in the discoveries and, and moves in exploration. It's basically team effort and not one individual. We formed a joint company with Sinclair to explore in Alaska. And we fiddled around in various bits of Alaska where there was licensing availability in the south, which were a failure. And this was just the luck of the game. But our main hope was always the North Slope, which was the main objective for going in there. 
The piece of work which it was absolutely fundamental to our understanding was done by the then chief geologist, who is now dead, a man by the name of Jim Spence. And Jim did realize that the geological history of Prudhoe Bay High was different from that of the Colville High. We had our eye on a far northern belt of potential, and we covered this with seismic work, and we were the first people that did that outside the US Navy. Various other companies came in and virtually duplicated our work. This included Richfield, for one. Atlantic Richfield, Arco, ironically now part of the BP Group, were the first to hit oil in Prudhoe Bay. Arco's original discovery well, sending shockwaves throughout the petroleum world triggering an intense search by many more oil companies, prior, of course, to the exciting September 69 North Shore oil lease sale. The state of Alaska put the area up for sale. On September 1969 shattered all records, Alaska receiving over $900 million. BP's geologists had put them in the right place, and they proved to be very lucky indeed with their bids. Secretary of the Interior Wally Hickel, the former governor of Alaska, said, Why, we're talking about 40 billion barrels of oil on the whole North Slope. The whole climate there is, if you like, more commercially oriented, and, and paying a lot for the rights to the oil that you hadn't found was normal, though it wasn't for BP. The engineering problems facing the company were every bit as challenging as those they'd found half a century ago in Majidi Suleiman. How were they going to get the oil out? Arco Humble and BP decided to build a pipeline 800 miles long from Prudhoe Bay to Valdez in the south. The project was seriously delayed, firstly because of the effects on the frozen surface of the landscape. When we talk of soils in the lower 48, we're thinking of the true definition of soil. Up here, our soil is all rock. There's no just digging a ditch and dropping it in. So we're fighting uh, frozen ground here for ice cubes with sand and gravel mixed into them is what we're fighting all the time. A lot of it is permafrost. You, you get a, a top layer of about 18 inches will thaw during the five months of summer. Blooms beautifully, lovely. But when you go down, whether it's stable depends on what the, it was originally. If it's, if it's rock or gravel, you're fine. But a lot of it is a sort of kind of sludge, which is only solid because it's frozen and it remains permanently frozen. So when we started the line, we knew damn well there was a lot of, would have to come above ground because with the test boreholes that had gone on, we knew you were into pure, pure ice. As well, the green movement were worried about the effects on the animals, who were about the only inhabitants of the bleak, inhospitable interior of Alaska. The caribou, just like passing cows, they don't care. They, they wanted to hump the pipe up to make big caribou fast throughs, but they will walk under the low thing. They're not stupid. If they see some nice chump of grass, they'll bell their head and go underneath. Right. Uh, you know, and bears were a continual problem. They had these water tanks, you know, uh, plastic rubber tanks for water in the construction site. And the bears used to love to play trampoline on them. <laughs> and times used to rip holes in them. And uh, the routine was if the same bear kept making them sore, they used to shoot him with one of these drug things and take him way up country. So he, hoping he couldn't find his way back. They say some of the buggers used to find their way back. Say they recognise the same bear. <laughs> BP formed an alliance with Standard Oil of Ohio, Sohio, a company originally part of John D. Rockefeller's empire, in order to exploit its huge share of Prudhoe Bay crude. Sohio were good at the downstream, refining and selling. 
the Standard Oil offshoot started in 1870, 1880. I mean, they had a 50-year lead on BP into that downstream. The man beside the pump became the ambassador of the skilled army that worked endlessly behind the scenes to give us what we wanted. Were we grateful for his services? You bet we were. So even in terms of, of location, they picked up many of the best corner sites. They might have had property developed all around them, but the guys that are there and have put a gas station on the, the busiest corner are still generally in business. And so it was that competition that, that BP had to face up to. But by the 80s, Sohio was losing money. Frankly, in my view, the Standard Oil Management wasted a lot of the income from Alaska in pretty abortive investments. The Alaska Pipeline, brought to you in part by Sohio. We're working to keep you on fall. Certainly by 1986, we had lost confidence in that management's ability. And there was, I think, on our calculation, some $6 billion that had been invested in the previous five years, which had shown no return at all. I proposed to the non-execs, in a bit of a coup d'etat, that I would put in Horton and John Brown and would expect them, the board of Sohio, to ask, because their responsibility, to ask their chairman and president to leave the company and be replaced by Horton and Brown. This was very dramatic stuff, and people thought we would look fearsome and, and be very unpleasant and came with very bad news. And indeed, we had a lot of bad news and a lot of tough stuff to do. I think they were very apprehensive indeed, and I spent the first uh, three weeks of my time here getting around talking to people. I had over 30 what they call town hall meetings to assure people that I don't have two horns and a tail. But I remember the entry with people inspecting me, wondering, you know, it was the first time in my life where I'd really been looked at as someone who came with bad news, who should be inspected carefully and not trusted. Uh, we had to work very hard to make sure that wasn't the case. Cue the announcement. Tonight, we witness an evolution of metamorphosis. In short, a change. So Ohio becomes BP. I'd worked on a proposal to actually effectively uh, sack quite a lot of the board at, a, at an annual general meeting and to seize control of the board on behalf of BP and then to squeeze out the minority. It was a very tough uh, financial transaction that we'd worked up, uh, which I think in the end, uh, Peter Walters correctly uh, said, this is not in the style of BP, it's too strong. Uh, and this would have been a very inexpensive way of BP actually buying so high, something like uh, at a 40% less than what I think BP paid for it. But I think Peter was right, and, and I must say I was surprised about the decision at the time, but it shows you how experience does, I think, add a lot of value to decisions. But buying companies is expensive. The late 80s and early 90s saw BP paying the price for its acquisition. There was a reorganization program under a new and not always popular chairman, Robert Horton. It was a good year for BP in very challenging times. But the slimming down of Project 1990 couldn't protect the company from a worldwide recession and after the 1991 Gulf War, a fall in the price of oil. BP's non-executive directors asked for and received Horton's resignation in 1992. The company was stagnating. He was the last chairman and chief executive of the company. And it was at a period when governance and accountability at the highest level in boards was being rethought. A chap, whoever he had been, was in charge of a company at a bad time in a cycle who took a wrong strategic decision if he was both chairman and chief executive, was eminently more vulnerable than when you have a chairman and a chief executive and you can see where the choices were made. I'm David Simon, your new chief executive, sometimes known by other names, one of which is Dags. David so, uh, Simon was made chief executive. Uh, 
He'd made his career in European marketing. As well as finding oil, you have to be able to sell it, and David Simon knew all about that. The key thing, according to Simon, was the balance between what the company spent and how it made its money back. It was to do with three actions in the company. Reducing capital spend, which we had to do for the reasons I said, because of the cycle. Reducing the cost uh, structure in the business and hitting a profit target. Between them, Simon and John Brown brought the company back from the brink. And they didn't just do it by cutting costs. From 1990, BP turned once again to its great strength, exploration. Lo and behold, we rediscovered what people knew all along. That you, you want to be successful in this business, the first thing you've got to do is find big oil fields. One of the principal reasons behind this was a revolution in the geological thinking of the explorers inside the company. Their first major success came at the end of the 80s in the Gulf of Mexico. There was no point in exploring the deep water, there's areas beyond a thousand meters. Until the late 80s, people hadn't got the engineering concepts to allow you to produce. So we certainly knew that this was likely to occur in the Gulf of Mexico. We had inklings around similar places where you know, the great rivers of the world in over the last 50 million years have dumped enormous amounts of sediment. So it's worth going and looking at all the great deltas of the world, which most of them have lasted for the last you know, 100 million years. The rivers tend to be there for a long time. Their geological success gave BP enormous power, but they had to up their game in refining and marketing the downstream. Brown began to have talks with Amoco, a Chicago-based company with an enormous refinery just outside the city who was struggling to stay in the big league. I then turned to uh, Amoco. Uh, I rang Larry Fuller up, literally, one day and said, Larry, I think I'd like to come and talk to you about the future. And I said, have you ever thought about merging with anybody? To be careful what you have to say. But he said it wasn't on his agenda, but perhaps we could meet the day after Leadership. the phone call. I was in London, he was in America. So I said, absolutely, and I flew over on Concord and met him in the Concord lounge and we had our first discussion about the possibility of getting the two companies together. We tried to get the so-called dual structure, whereby we would sort of merge, but not quite. But it didn't work. And then in the end, I called Larry and said, Larry, this is not going to work unless you tell your board the following. That we're going to fully merge. Uh, BP is going to take the majority interest. We're going to have more directors than you. And let me know if that's acceptable. Otherwise, it's off. And uh, we had some fairly tense moments in my house. Uh, and he came back and said, it's on. And I said, fine, we're announcing tomorrow. And we did just that. We announced in August 98. And it was then the world's largest merger, largest industrial merger, and it was a tremendous surprise. Something extraordinary is coming to Amoco. It will change your gasoline buying experience, but it won't change your gasoline. You'll still be able to buy the same Amoco gasoline you've always bought, but the environment in which you buy it will be brighter, smarter, more inviting than ever before. And the best part is, this is just the beginning. BP, going beyond. You know, we always thought of BP as an upstream company and Amico as a downstream company. So, particularly being in the downstream, we just saw this as opportunity. And right at that time, absolutely no concerns about jobs or stability, just more kit to play with. The merger with Amoco brought in more refining capacity and expertise. The Whiting refinery outside Chicago was up and running nearly 20 years before Abadan got started. It was originally part of Standard Oil, and it was here that catalytic cracking 
the refining of crude oil into stuff you can put in your car was invented. After that, I got a phone call from uh, Mike Bolin, the chairman and chief executive of Arco, who, simply put, it's the first time it's ever happened to me, he said, we think you should buy our company. USBP should buy Arco. And I said, well, I hadn't thought about it, but uh, maybe we'll think about that. And so we did just that. So we bought uh, Arco, Amico, Sohio, uh, and that was an enormous collection of Standard Oil companies. So I think by number, we had more Standard Oil companies than anybody else. We'll be the largest producer of oil in the non-OPEC world, producing 2.7 million barrels a day. That's why today's harder working engine needs Castrol GTX. Engineered for the there were more acquisitions in the downstream area. Castrol, who'd been selling lubricants for engines since 1899, and Arrow with a long established network of gas stations in Germany. And BP were also looking at joint ventures, the biggest and most publicized of which had been started back in the early 90s when the old communist empires began to crumble. People forget we were terrified at one stage that there might be a famine in Moscow. I remember eating in the restaurant in the Savoy Hotel, which was decked out in silver gilt, and, I mean, incredibly ornate. The food was dreadful. And we sat picking at our food, and it had windows, and we were watching crowds coming and pressing their noses on the window, watching us eat. It was a terrible moment, a very desperate situation. Coming out of this huge shock therapy of getting rid of the state and privatizing everything. But meanwhile, all these oligarchs were in formation. You know, they were buying these cheap shares, they were, you know, creating asset accumulations. So we looked around and we found Mr. Vladimir Potanin. Potanin, a well-connected Russian who was first deputy prime minister under Yeltsin, owned a large share of Sedanko, an outfit with shares in a giant gas field. BP bought into the company. Another oligarch, Mikhail Friedman, using Russia's new post-Soviet bankruptcy laws, went after Sidanko's and therefore BP's assets. But Brown, by blocking Friedman's US loans, forced the oligarch to give ground. John Brown actually got a lot of respect from the senior Russians because of the, the way that he, the lines he took, to the Sidanko investment going completely pear-shaped. I mean, they wrote off half of it. I mean, they, knew, they took a very big write down against the purchase price. People make the analogy with the, um, the oligarchs of the early 20th century in, in the US. And, it, and it, in some senses, that's legitimate. It's a, a period of you know, great change and great opportunity. I refused to talk to them for some considerable period of time. I, I wouldn't speak to Friedman until peace broke out on our existing assets, and so peace did in fact break out. By 2003, Patanin was out of the way, and in February of that year, Brown and Friedman reached agreement to form a new jointly owned company registered in the British Virgin Islands, TNK BP. So, you know, this was Wild West stuff. It really was wild, wild, wild west. But again, we looked at it and said this was a place we had to go. The other major legacy Brown left the company was his revolutionary attitude to the effect of hydrocarbons on the environment. It started as early as 1997. The concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is rising and the temperature of the Earth's surface is increasing. The role of business is to provide solutions. It's not to say there's a problem when we can't do anything about it. And it's certainly not sensible to say there is no problem. 
Brown pledged a program that included BP monitoring its own greenhouse gas emissions and expanding its renewable energy program, notably in solar power, an area where BP already had 10% of the world market. I think it's a reasonable possibility that the second half of the 21st century will be the solar century. You know, we will find a way of taking the sun's energy and creating energy for ourselves in a very efficient way that is uh, competitive and better than hydrocarbons. And, and if you think about it, you know, rather than the sun plant buried for 200 million years, dug up, processed, create energy through hydrocarbons, if you can go sort of route one from sun through a solar cell to energy, that will be a great thing for uh, humankind to achieve. It's all about probabilities. You know, it remains about probabilities, but of course that's something that BP deals with. I mean, if you don't understand probabilities, you really shouldn't be in the exploration business. Green has always been part of the BP logo. But the image of the company had now, in the public's mind, become almost fatally confused with its environmental stance. Is it possible to drive a car and still have a clean environment? Beyond Petroleum, BP. We had become uh, too much concerned with trying to make a difference in the world and not recognising that to do that, the first thing you have to do is deliver really great business performance. So there were a lot of people in the company who were more worried about whether we were doing a good job in the world than whether we were actually making money for our shareholders. If I can be blunt, that's the reality. By 2004, uh, I realised that we basically were again running out of steam. Five years into the new millennium, Brown and the board were finding less and less common ground. And within 14 months, there was a series of disasters for BP. In March 2005, there was a tragic accident at Texas City Refinery in which 15 people died and 170 were injured. In July of that year, Hurricane Dennis ripped through BP's massive rig in the Gulf of Mexico, Thunder Horse. There were also allegations over propane trading activities in the US. And in March 2006, there was a leak in the pipeline at Prudhoe Bay. In May 2007, Brown stepped down from his post as head of the company. Come on, out of the way now, come on. All right. Tony Haywood, head of exploration and production, took over his job. There is only one way to um, deal with that sort of issue, and that's to confront it head on and say that it's clear that we have a serious failing and that we need to take serious action to uh, make good the failing. Haywood introduced what he called the forward agenda, improving the safety and reliability of the company's operations, growing revenue and reducing costs. Things as usual are changing, but its history does teach us that a hundred years on, the core of the business hasn't really changed that much. I think you have to recognise that the company was founded through exploration. The economic power that a large oil or gas field creates is huge. And it just means that even if when you discover it, the technology doesn't exist to develop it then, that technology will be developed. The technology will come along because of the power of that resource. Well, we've been on this rig for almost a year now. It'll be a year in March of 2009. And uh, it costs about half a million dollars a day to run this operation. So you can't stand here without reflecting on the past and what happened in Persia a hundred years ago. Reynolds himself had a drilling machine that could drill to 2,000 feet. He found oil at 1,100 feet. But the important thing is that spirit is the same. 
the technology, the people obviously are different, but the spirit of BP is ex today exactly the same as it was then. We do difficult things on the frontier, things that have not been done before. And that takes us to create things like this. The BP story might sound like the history of Britain in the 20th century. But the company has never become a government creature. It has made its own history, lived in the moment, and there are still frontiers to cross. The search to provide heat, light, and mobility will lead them towards technologies and resources which as yet can only be imagined.